guys and welcome to this week's video on using Snowflake and Data IQ together. Now if you've never heard of Data IQ, I'm going to give you a brief introduction of what it's all about and then we're going to dive into a quick start tutorial which I'm going to run you through. I've never used Data IQ before I went and did this demo and tutorial and I'm not a data scientist by trade. So I wanted to show you my experiences firsthand of how I found it. And if you stay to the end, I'll give you my views and my early opinions on Data IQ and where I see it fitting into the market and what problems I see it solving, but also stay to the end to see the issues that I ran into as well as part of using the Quick Start tutorial. Well, Data IQ positions itself as one central single solution for the design, deployment and management of AI applications. So that means you can connect and cleanse and prepare data for analytics and machine learning projects at scale. You can also explore and create statistical analysis charts and dashboards, some of which we'll see in our live demo shortly. And you can also build advanced machine learning models using the latest techniques, pretty much by dragging and dropping things into the recipes within Data IQ. So that includes feature engineering and automating the model training process itself. Now Data IQ projects, they're the central place for all of the work and collaboration for users. And each project has a visual flow, including the pipeline of data sets and recipes associated with the project. And that's exactly what we're gonna be working on in this demo with Snowflake. And so Data IQ aims to slot itself in across the entire life cycle of the statistical model and process, all the way through from data preparation to visualizing the outputs of your data sets before applying some machine learning algorithms to that data and then crucially being able to deploy the models and realize the value to your business that the models can provide. Now there's also support and capabilities that Data IQ offers as well. It really prides itself on collaboration and being able to share recipes and projects with other users and collaborate on that. Typically you're gonna have people in the organization who are gonna to wanna to benefit and leverage the good work that a, uh, an individual's done and instead of moving files around the network and trying to share data sets or even worse, duplicating efforts to, to get to that same end product. Data IQ has a built in in terms of collaboration from the ground up. And that goes from people building the models to actually data consumers consuming the insights as well. The governance aspect helps manage risk and ensure compliance at a, at a enterprise scale across the organization. And that includes things like audit trails, secure API access, single sign on and integration with LDAP. Explainability becoming increasingly important in terms of organizations having to provide transparency around how they interpret data to come up with um, the results that they're basing decisions on. So understanding model outputs to help increase the trust and visibility across what's happening within the machine learning process helps to explain that entire process and eliminate any bias as well. Finally, from an architectural perspective, the way it's set up and configured as we see again using the demo, especially with um, Snowflake providing the compute underneath a lot of the data science activities really helps deliver AI or ML initiatives at real scale. So let's hop into the live demo and uh, I'm going to take you through the Snowflake Quick Start Data IQ tutorial on a live basis. As I mentioned in the intro, this is the first time I'm going to be using Data IQ. You're going to be effectively walking through and learning it with me as well. And we're going to use Snowflake and Data IQ integrated together to create, run and evaluate a COVID-19 machine learning model. So what does that actually mean? Well, firstly, we're going to create some databases and objects and warehouses in Snowflake. We don't need to actually physically do that, as you'll see in a second, because the Partner Connect portal allows us to connect up to that and it will automatically generate the resources that we need in Snowflake. We're gonna access data in Snowflake's marketplace, so COVID-19 data sets. And we're gonna use Snowflake's Partner Connector, seamlessly create that Data IQ Cloud Trial. Next, we're gonna create a data science project within Data IQ and perform analysis on the data that we're querying from Snowflake through Data IQ. We're gonna create, run and evaluate a simple ML model in Data IQ and write those results back to Snowflake. Finally, we're going to use cloning and time travel in Snowflake to create a test environment. Now, as you'll see in the demo, we don't quite make it as far as that, and I'm hoping I can get those issues resolved so we can do a second follow-up part of this video so I can actually show you those final couple of steps. But we get a lot of the way into it, as you'll see. So now we're going to create our data IQ trial via the Snowflake Partner Connect. So at the top of the page, we need to make sure that we're in our account admin role. And now we're going to click Partner Connect. 
And you can see this is where all of Snowflake's partners have a section which allows you to quickly connect to their applications. So in this instance, we can go to Data IQ, and this brings up the following dialog box. Now this will automatically create the connections required for Data IQ to connect to the Snowflake account. Snowflake will create the dedicated database, warehouse, system user, and the associated passwords and roles with the intention of those being used with Data IQ. And you can see here we've got the database listed, the particular warehouse it's going to create to be dedicated for Data IQ use, system users, and the system role as well. And now we're going to click Connect. And we get this dialog box saying that the partner account is being created in the background. It's ready to be activated, so we'll click Activate. And this takes us to Data IQ sign up screen where it's populated with the email address. And I'll just show you where that email address comes from if you haven't got it configured already. If you go back into Snowflake and click Preferences, you can see here that I have got my email address associated with my user. By default, that's not populated. You need to go into your preferences for your user and click Add Email Address and add your email address into here. That's what Data IQ is used here on the login screen. So I'm going to put a password in, check the box and click sign up. Next, you're presented with the terms of service for Data IQ in the cloud. And you need to accept those and click next. Next, you've got to complete your sign up by populating these fields here. Once you've completed that screen, you will be then taken into the Data IQ dashboard on the cloud launch pad. So at this point, you've now set up your Data IQ trial account using Snowflake's Partner Connect. We're now ready to move on to the next step. So we're going to go back to the Snowflake browser. You'll notice now that in the browser, when we go back to it, you have a link here to activate your partner account. You've got to click on that. And that just confirms your Snowflake account is now linked with the DataIQ partner account. So back into the Snowflake web UI, we're now going to head to the Snowflake marketplace. So to do that, again, we want to make sure that we're still running under the account admin role at the moment. And we're going to click Data Marketplace from the top, and we're going to click Explore the Snowflake Data Marketplace. If you're not familiar with the Snowflake Data Marketplace, I'll put a link up at the top of the screen now to look at the video from last week, which gives you a quick overview of what Snowflake Data Marketplace is and where it fits into the whole ecosystem. So now we're going to get taken into SnowSite, which is Snowflake's next generation version of the classic web UI. And this is where you can access the marketplace listings. Now we're going to be looking at COVID-19 data um, by Star Schema. It's used in a lot of the Snowflake demos. So note that it switched me back to the sysadmin role by default as I've logged in to SnowSide. So I'm going to make sure I change that now to the account admin. That allows me to consume data sets from the marketplace. I'm now going to click get data and I get this pop-up box. I then can give my database a name, anything I want, and that's how it will appear and look in my own Snowflake environment. When I click Get Data, there'll be no physical data movements behind the scenes. What it will do though, is it'll create a database in my Snowflake account, which will look, behave, and feel like that database is part of my Snowflake account, when really it's just a logical container containing the data from Star Schema's COVID-19 data set. When Star Schema updates this data, we'll automatically see those updates instantaneously in our own Snowflake account. If I click done on here now, it says the data is ready to query. I go back into my Snowflake environment and click refresh. You will now see I have the COVID-19 database within my own environment with all of the tables in there as well. Now for the purposes of this demo, we're gonna go into the warehouses. We're gonna look at the data IQ virtual warehouse that was created for us as part of the partner account and we're going to click configure we're actually going to change it from the default of extra small to medium we're not going to change any other sentence because it may um, burn through your credits on your trial account a lot faster than you wish but we're just going to scale it up to a medium just for performance purposes and if you're interested in finding out more about how the size of your virtual warehouse 
dictates the performance of your workload. So I'll, I'll pop a link at the top of the screen for you to take a look at. So we're now going to go back to Data IQ into the Launchpad, and we're going to click on Open Data IQ DSS. Now notice that we've got a fully finished example of the COVID-19 project that we're going to create in this demo. It's available as soon as you log in, so you will see this as well. It's part of the Partner Connect account. It makes this available to you as well, so it's, it's worthwhile having a look at that or just being aware of it, if nothing else. So we're going to click New Project over here on the right-hand side and a blank project. We're going to call it COVID-19 and click Create. And we've created our project within DataIQ. So note now we've got our project name, the date it was created, who created it, and we've also got a timeline of changes that have been made to the project since it was created. We can also see the number of objects as part of our project. At the moment, we've got one dashboard in there by default. Everything else is empty at the moment. We can add a description here, and the description of the project is written in Markdown. And we can link specific data IQ objects, such as data sets or save models within the description as well. So it's really quite neat in terms of being able to link it to other projects or artifacts within your data IQ environment. But the first thing we're going to do is we're going to import some specific data sets from Snowflake from our COVID-19 data set that we've just imported from the Snowflake Data Marketplace. So we're going to click Import Your First Data Set. We're going to go to SQL and we're going to click on Snowflake. You can see that the connection is already pre-populated for us, which is really handy. We're going to specify a particular table, so we can click Get the Tables List. So now I've got a list of tables all within my Snowflake account that it's read from the metadata in the Snowflake account that's got access to on this connection. I firstly want to use this table called JHU underscore COVID-19. And then I'm going to click Test Table. And you can see that it says Connection OK, everything goes green, we get a preview of the table. To validate our connection, it's validated, it can read the data from the table. So now it's successful, we're going to click Create. Next, a new data set name. And so we've now we've imported this data set into our project. Now, just bear in mind, in the background, that would have fired up our virtual warehouse and to be able to access the data and import it into, into Data IQ as well. So just be aware of that. Now we're going to return to the flow by clicking this flow icon here. And now you can see that we're presented with a graphical user interface. And this is where you create your recipes within this workbench. We're just going to import another uh, data set first of all. So we're going to click data set, search and import. We're going to use that predefined connection. We're not worried about restricting it to a database or schema at this stage. And we're going to look for a particular table. And we're looking for this global mobility report table. We're going to import that table and we're going to create that data set. Notice that we're creating another data set, but we're doing it in a slightly different way this time. But the results are the same. We've imported this data set from our Snowflake account. Now, if we go back up and click our flow, we can see we've got both data sets in there, completely independent of each other at the moment. We're going to double click on the JHU underscore COVID-19 data set. And this table contains data on a location and day basis about the number and the types of cases. And the types of cases can be active, confirmed, deaths or recovered on that particular day. Now, by default, Data IQ reads in the first 10,000 rows as a sample. But the sample method can be changed under Configure Sample up here. But for now, for this purposes, we're just going to leave it with 10,000 records. There's more than that. Now, Data IQ automatically detects the data types uh, with a meaning of each column. And this status bar here, the green status bar with elements of red in here, shows how much data is valid, so that's the green symbol, invalid, which is red, and missing, which is gray. And if you hover over it, you can get some percentage figures on how much falls into each category. Now you can view column specific statistics by clicking over here on quick column statistics. And this is a really useful feature that I find. It gives you a quick preview into the data characteristics within each column. So for example, we've got county here. 
we can hover over it and we can see that Washington makes up 17.4% of our data set that we've sampled. We've also got a blank country data set that's making up 16.2%, Franklin, and so on. Again, we can do this across the board. We can see dates and trends and patterns potentially. And here's our case types, confirmed, deaths, active, etc. Again, it's all based upon our sample data set that we've brought into Data IQ. Now, if you want more detail on a particular column that you're interested in, such as case type, you can click into here and click Analyze. And this gives you more detail on that particular column than you can get from the quick column statistics that we just looked at before. Okay, so let's go back to the flow. We're going to double click on our global mobility report data set now. And we can see that this table contains data on a location basis. And this data set really aims to provide some insights into what's changed in response to policies aimed at combating COVID-19. And this data set reports movements and trends over time by geography across different categories of places, such as retail and recreation, groceries and pharmacies, parks, transit stations, workplaces and residential areas. Now we're going to carry out some data preparation, first of all, and I'll show you how you do that. We're going to go back to our flow. We're going to click on our JHU COVID data set, and we're going to perform some simple aggregations across our two data sets. And this will help us understand changes in mobility and new cases of COVID-19 across specific geographical regions. So to do that, we're going to use some recipes on the right hand side here, which are pre-built recipes that allow you to drag and drop visually onto the workspace. So we're going to select group and we're going to choose to group our COVID-19 data set by country region. And you can see that's our input data set coming in to the recipe itself. And this is what's going to be output where the data is going to be stored. So within Snowflake itself, we can click create recipe. And now we'll want to add some additional keys to group on. So in this top section, that's where you do that. And we're going to use the select key to add drop down, followed by the add button for group in province state and case type and date. So here you can see how you're able to group the data by adding uh, particular columns or keys in this case, and the terminology that's referred to to aggregate the data set. In the same section, we're gonna uncheck this compute count for each group option as we don't require this statistic. So we're gonna find the field difference and we're gonna click on this and we're gonna click on the sum aggregation. And there are four case types, as we mentioned in this John Hopkins data set, but we only wanna use and predict using deaths and confirmed. So we'll filter out active and recovered records. And to do that, we can go to the left-hand side and we can look at this workflow. And we wanna filter out this data prior to the aggregation, the grouping that we're gonna do. So if we click pre-filter here, we can switch the filter on using this toggle switch. And we're going to keep only rows that satisfy all of the following conditions. And you can see there's various different options here. You can even type in the SQL expression directly into the dialog box if you so wish. I'm going to select case type and we're going to pick is different from in the drop down box. And then we're going to enter recovered. And then we're going to add a condition and case type is different from active and also we're going to add another condition i know that there's data that's problematic from peru so we're going to enter peru as a filter for the country region to filter out that data it's really important to note as well that these values are case sensitive so if i was to type peru in uppercase for example it wouldn't work correctly and you need to make sure that all of the following conditions are set here so only rows that satisfy all of the following conditions and not anything else. So you can see what we're building up here really. If you're used to writing SQL, you get a sense of what's happening underneath the covers here and what's going to be passed through to Snowflake. So now we're going to click run and notice that it says in database SQL. It's going to push the SQL logic down into Snowflake to make the most of the scalable compute architecture within Snowflake itself. So now we can see the job is running and the build has started. And we can see the job has succeeded go back to Snowflake, we can see our virtual warehouse has started. I'm just going to suspend that for the moment. If I go to history and I look at this particular query, uh, there's quite a few queries that have been run in the background by Data IQ. Most of them just 
small queries checking metadata. However, if I look into this one, we can see here that this is our aggregation of the sum difference by our key columns that we've selected. And here's our pre-filter as well. That's put in as a where clause. And so data IQ under the covers has written the SQL based upon the options that we've dragged and dropped all through the nice user interface. And it, it's actually wrote quite a well-formed SQL. You probably wouldn't write it longhand completely in the same way, but it's included all the format that you would expect as well, converting time zones and so on. So you don't need to worry about the syntax of that. So if you're not familiar with writing SQL directly on Snowflake or writing SQL at all, it allows you to still work with the data and filter data out and under the covers it will still generate really good native SQL that's going to run really well, be really performant on your Snowflake environment. So I really wanted just to dip into that and show you what that looked like. Now if we go back into our flow, you can see now that we've got our input data set, our group recipe and the output data set that is after the aggregation has been applied. Now we want to do something similar to the global mobility report data set. We're going to click on that and we're going to click group. This time we're going to click group by country region again. So this time we're going to add a few key columns. So for the group keys, I'm just going to add province date and date to the group keys. Notice I can either select them from here like I did in the previous example or use this drop down box of actions and select users group keys and it'll just add them en masse. If you've got multiple, that's a really good little tip for you. Next, we want to look at everything from grocery and pharmacy change percentage down to workplaces change percentage and use the check boxes to highlight these. Again, we're going to use this actions drop down and we're going to ask it to apply averages to these six selected columns. And we're going to uncheck the compute count again for each group because we just don't need that statistic. We're going to run this recipe in database again. So it's creating the build, generating the SQL and pushing it down to Snowflake and executing the code where the data lives. So there's no data movement in and out of Snowflake. It's just using Snowflake's resources to process this data. We're gonna go back to our flow. We're gonna highlight this uh, data set we created earlier for the John Hopkins data. And um, this is our aggregated data set, if you remember, and it includes a column for each case type and the difference summed from the previous row that we also group by country, region, state, date, and the type in the previous step. However, we'd like to change the data format so that the case type and difference are on their own separate columns. So we've got confirmed and deaths as separate individual columns. And we can do this using the pivot recipe. So you're gonna pivot the data on the case type. We're gonna click create recipe. And now we're presented with this screen where we've actually got some examples and it gives you a visual representation, which I find really helpful of how the data is coming in on the input and how the data will look depending on the settings that you actually choose. So this is really helpful just to visualize the data before actually executing any code. In this instance, we're actually gonna use one of these examples. We're gonna select pivot table and then we need to pick some row identifiers. So how we're gonna actually select those rows we want pivoted. So in the dropdown for row identifiers, we're gonna pick country region, province state and the date and then notice here, it's defaulted to select the count of the records to populate the content within our pivot table. We're gonna deselect that. That's not what we want in this case. And notice when I deselect it, we get an error saying that we need to choose at least one aggregation to be able to allow this pivot recipe to run. And we also get errors on our workflow on the left-hand side. So really obvious and really helpful in terms of pinpointing where those error messages and what they relate to and where in the workflow they're going to cause you a problem. So really helpful if you're not that familiar with using SQL and need a bit of guidance of, of where to spend your time and effort. So we're going to click on the add new drop down box. And we've only got one value here. So it's the difference and the sum of the difference. So it's from the previous step, the aggregation. So we'll select that. And you can see it's defaulted to count, which is not what we want in this case. We want to select the minimum. 
like so. And now, if your example looks like this as well, you can click the run. And now the job has succeeded, so let's go and have a look at that uh, output data set here. So we can double click on it. And we can see we've got new columns for confirmed case types and defs case types. We can also see there's quite a lot of missing data for province state, highlighted by this gray area, 23% empty, it's telling us here, from our sample 10,000 records. Now the recipes we've used so far, such as grouping and pivots, just perform a given individual task, and they're gonna be familiar to you if you're used to writing SQL code and working with data. And in the prepare recipe, it allows you to clean and enrich your data interactively. And that means you've got tools for data cleansing, normalization, and enrichment of data. The terminology that you use in data IQ on the DSS side of things, processes, and in the prepare recipe, you use them in a visual and interactive way as we've seen so far. And there's a wide range of processes we can use in the prepare recipe, and we're gonna use a few of the simplest ones to help us with some of the missing data. So from the flow, we're going to click on the grouped and pivoted uh, JHU data set, and then we're going to click on the prepare recipe. Now you can see that the default name is getting a bit out of hand now. It's just keep uh, suffixing additional uh, words to the end of it. So we're probably going to want to tidy that up a little bit. Let's change that to JHU COVID-19 prepared, something a little bit more succinct, and click create recipe. So we want to handle the missing data that we've identified in the province state column here. And so we'll, there's lots of different ways we could handle this, but we're just going to use the prepare recipe to fill the empty rows. We're going to click on the drop down here and we're going to select fill empty rows with, and this brings up a dialog box. And we can set a constant value or even the most frequent value of the mode itself. In this case, we're just going to set a constant value and just keep it simple. We're just going to put NA for non-applicable. We're going to click OK. You can see now the gray has disappeared from our statistical analysis. Notice that the step also gets added to the left-hand side here of our workload. So we've got a script with one step in it and basically replacing those empty values. We're going to click add a new step and you can see all the different processes you've got available to you, along with lots of different options here. And if you scroll down through them, it gives you basically the, a description of what the transformation or cleansing task is, as well as some examples. So really user-friendly and intuitive as well, all within the same workbench. I really like the fact that you get to see everything interactively within the same screen. It does really help from an efficiency perspective. We're going to select data cleansing from the processor library, and we're going to select remove rows where the cell is empty. You can see it's added a second step to our script now, and it's prompting us to add some information in here. So the first thing we're going to do is change it from a single to multiple columns, and we're going to click add a column, and we want to bring in country region and date. And so when country, region, and date is empty, we're going to remove those records from our data set completely. Now, before we're going to run this recipe, we're finished configuring it for now for our basic data cleansing activities. Notice that it says local stream underneath our run. And this means that all data will go through the DSS server, but it doesn't need to be in memory because data is streamed, hence the name. But we, we want to push it down to our database. So we're going to click this and we're going to pick in database and we're going to click run and our job is now succeeded. So we'll go back to our flow and we actually want to carry out the same data cleansing activities, the exact same ones, but on our other data set our global mobility report data set this time. But rather than repeat all those tasks and steps again that we've just went through, why should we need to do that when we've already created it on our workflow here? So what we're going to do, we're going to single click on the previously created recipe here. And from the actions menu, we're going to click copy. And in the dialog box, we're going to click this drop down box where it has replacement for, we're gonna pick our global mobility report by country region, which is our aggregated data set. 
and we're going to give the output a name and click create recipe and then we're going to click run to execute the copied recipe and that job succeeded so let's go back to the flow so now we've done some relatively basic data cleansing activities on both our data sets as well as some transformations we're now at the point where we want to join our data sets together so now we're going to click on our output data sets. We're going to hold the shift key so we can select both of them. And we're going to click the join recipe. So here you can see our input data sets. We've got our two input data sets, which is going to generate one output data set after the join is applied. We're going to click create recipe. And data IQ automatically detects any potential candidate keys that it can join these data sets on. And the default join type is a left join. And I assume that's just in case and inner join is incorrectly uh, taken out records that users want to see and they may not be familiar with all the different join types. So I assume that left join is automatically selected as a default for that reason. But if you know any different, you can let me know in the comments below. I'd be interested to know what your take is on that. In this case, however, we want to change it to an inner join. So it's just as simple as using the drop down and selecting the join type. If you want to change the join type conditions, we can just click on the value assigned here and you get various options in here so either an and or in terms of the set for joins as well as some other ones as and a custom sql condition as well where you can add your own logic in there in this case we're going to just leave the default as is and we're going to click run Okay, so now we've explored, we've cleaned, we've aggregated and joined our data. We now want to create some features. We'd like to compute some lag features to see if past trends can help predict future ones when we start modeling. To do this, we can use the window recipe for this. So we go back to our flow. Now a window function performs a calculation across a set of table rows that are somehow in one way or another related to the current row. If you're used to using window functions within SQL, exactly the same as that. And it's almost like applying an aggregate across a subset of group records within the entire data set based upon the logic that you provide. So we're gonna click on our output data sets that we've now generated from our two data sets we've just joined together. And we're gonna click on the window recipe and create recipe. Under window definitions, we're gonna switch on partition and columns and we're going to select country region. We're going to add a column and select province state. And as we are creating historical lag variables, we're going to go ahead and toggle on order columns and select the date. We're going to click on aggregations next, and we're going to select all the columns except for the ones we used for partition, partitioning and ordering. We're going to select actions and retrieve original value is already selected. We're going to check as well value in a previous row. And here we've got our lag difference of so the difference of a previous row. So in these lag boxes, we're going to specify one, two, seven and 14. This will give us the previous day's value the day before one week and then two weeks ago. So we're going to copy and paste this into all of the lag differences and if you know a quicker way of doing this again let me know in the comments and then we're going to click run to run the recipe in database okay and that job has now succeeded so let's go back to our flow before we apply a machine learning model we need to split the data into the training and test data sets so to do that we're going to select the join data set and split recipe on our output, we're going to click add. We're going to call one of the data sets train and click create data set. And we're going to click add. And we're going to set this data set to test and click create data set. Once we've created both of those data sets, we'll then click create recipe. And now we need to split the data by 80% and 20%. So we're now going to select dispatch percentiles of sorted data. And this is where we can specify our ratios. So we're going to sort the data according to the date. We're going to pick an 80% ratio, which is going to be used to train our model. And the remaining 20% is going to be our test data. Finally, we're going to select the pre-filter stage. 
And we only want to keep rows where the def difference is greater than zero. So we're going to toggle the filter on, pick difference sum minimum greater than zero. And we're going to run the split recipe. Okay, that job has now succeeded. And now we are ready to start our modeling. So we're going to go back to the flow. We're going to click on the train data set. We're going to click lab. And then we're going to click auto ML prediction. Now our target variable here is defs difference sum min. And we're going to select quick prototypes and click create. And it tells us the design of the model is already being prepared and you can train it now or review the design. We're going to go and review the design first of all. So on the left hand side under the train slash test set section, we're going to enable time ordering. And we're going to set the date is the time variable. Since we're not working with a huge data set here, we can go ahead and set the sampling method to no sampling. So we use the whole data set. And next we're going to go across to the features section on left hand side and select features handling. This is where we can interact with some of the features to dictate how they should be used during machine learning and how should different variable types be handled if they are used. So for our prediction, uh, we will work with just numer numerical data. So let's toggle off the country, region, the province, date, and date. The remaining numerical features can remain as the defaults, allowing for rescaling prior to training. Finally, on the algorithm section within the model and pane, we can click into that and you can see we've got many different algorithms we can select from. Here we're going to concentrate on just some simple regression. So we're going to toggle on only ridge regression and lasso regression here. Now that we're done, we're going to click on the train button on the top right and we can optionally name the train and session itself and give it a description. In this case, I'm just going to click train. Now in the background, DSS will spin up the resources and train the model in line with the configuration settings that we've just configured. For the first session, we can see that the... So for this first session, we can now see that the models have finished training and we can see the lasso regression here has outperformed the ridge regression in regards to the metric we're evaluating. And this is the R2 score. So in this case, the closer this score is to one, the better. So we can click on the name of the model here to drill down into more details. So when in the model summary screen here, if you ever want to return to the model training, you can just click models at the top. And I'll take you back to the result pane and you can go straight into the design area here as well. So in regression coefficients, we can view the variables with their coefficient and how they correspond to the model scoring. Under the performance section on left hand side menu, we can click scatter plot. Now if the model was perfect, all the points would be plotted along the single diagonal line. That would mean that the predicted values are exactly equal to the actual values, but in reality, that's never really going to be the case. Points below the line are the underestimates and above the line are overestimates. So your general aim here in creating a model is to minimize the distance from the points to the diagonal line here. So this example could be approved upon in these areas, but for first run, it's fairly reasonable. And for this demo, it's absolutely fine. Again, then click on subpopulation analysis under the interpretation menu. And this area can be useful for assessing if the model behaves the same across different subpopulations. So in this case, let's analyze by country. So we can pick country region and click compute. And you can see in this case, the model did fairly well for the US, India and Mexico, but less well in many of the other countries we have as part of this data set. If you're modeling this for real, that's probably something you'd want to explore further. And you would start that model and iterative process of changing your variables and feature engineering and retraining your model until you had a desired outcome applicable to your own requirements. But for now, we're just going to go ahead and deploy the model. So we're going to click deploy and click create. Now we can see the model has been deployed to our flow. And our final task will be to score a deploy model against the test data set to evaluate the model fit. So if we click on the model here, we can then click score. We can pick our test. That's the input data set and we're going to click create recipe. Next, we're going to change it to run in database again and click run. So the DSS platform is firing up the resources within Snowflake underneath to support this scoring of the model. And unfortunately, as you can see, we've run into a problem here. We are getting a 
error saying number out of representable range. There's an overflow on the prediction column. I've went back into Snowflake and had a look at that and I get the same error there as well. So unfortunately, um, that's the end of the demo for the time being. I've reached out to, to my friends at Deirdre IQ and I'm pretty sure that they'll be able to give me one or two pointers. But for now, that's where we'll leave it. I'll give you my final, I'll give you my um, early opinions around Deirdre IQ. And hopefully we'll do a second part where we can complete the quick start tutorial. Okay, so how do I sum up my first experiences of Data IQ? Well, as you saw, I only used a, a small amount of the available functionality there. You know, I didn't test any collaboration out or any of those kind of tools. But what I was really impressed about was the interactive, intuitive user interface. Once you know how to do things, it's actually really productive and there's lots of different shortcuts and techniques, some of which we touched upon in the demo that can really help you from a pro productivity standpoint. I also really like the fact that it provides a, a real layer of abstraction from the underlying technology. You as the user don't need to worry about anything, it's all taken care of. As we saw as well, the SQL generated by Data IQ and the ability to push that down for in-database operations is really good and again you don't need to be an expert in SQL or need to understand the specific syntax of the underlying data platform that you're working with either. So I found all of those things to be really really useful. In the real world I think you're still going to have to have a, a level of knowledge around data manipulation and ideally how SQL is applied to tables to use some of the more basic recipes for data preparation and grouping and so on, and certainly some of the window functions that we looked at as well. I think that'd be really quite hard to get your head around if you haven't had any prior experience or exposure to those kind of things. And then when you enter the lab itself, I can only imagine those, those real kind of statisticians or data scientists actually going into that lab environment. So I like the fact that it's separated those two elements out in the web UI. So if you're not a statistician and you're not into modeling, you don't get overwhelmed by all of the options. So I think that's really good because you can almost see how that one platform, that one tool, provides everything that you need in that within that user interface. You don't need to go outside of the tool and switch between different tabs on your web browser to go back to Snowflake and to go back to Data IQ. You can do everything within the DSS workbench, the Data Science workbench. I really like that fact that everything is in one place, but also you've got that level of separation between roles where you can see your data kind of analysts and your power users doing a lot of the data preparation, using those recipes out of the box. And then if you're a data scientist and you really want to get into the statistical modeling, then you go into the lab environment and do what you need to do there. So I like the way that workflow is separated within the product as well. So all in all, even though I had an issue with it, I got a really good feel for it. I like the recipes. I like the way you can visually um, also see the outcomes of things, certainly in the windowed recipe that we... So overall, I think it's a really good product and uh, I'd be keen to get my hands on doing some of the collaboration aspects and some of the other functionality that it prides itself on as well. So maybe in a, in a future video, if you guys find this useful, let me know in the comments what you'd like to see and we could get into some more specific details around the product. But in the meanwhile, I hope you find it useful. New videos coming soon.